What is the most effective treatment for depression? Well, most doctors will actually tell you that it's ECT, electroconvulsive therapy. And this is essentially a procedure where you are sedated, two electrodes are placed on your head and a seizure is induced. And oftentimes this is repeated over 20 times in the course of a month. Now, if there's something about this that sounds kind of barbaric, it's because it is, because you're subjecting the brain to repeated seizures with the hope that the fallout, the cognitive fallout from this is going to lift someone's depression. And this isn't a surprise. If you are in a severely depressed state, causing a seizure in the brain is gonna release a whole bunch of neurochemicals. It can also cause some kind of euphoria, and that may make some people actually feel better. And unfortunately, this isn't actually new because psychiatry actually has a long history of inducing kind of injuries to the brain for treatments. For instance, way back in the day, they used to do something called insulin coma therapy, where you, you would give patients a lot of insulin, it would crash out their blood sugar so low, their brain would begin to starve and a seizure would take place. And they noticed that after those seizures had taken place, some of those patients actually looked better to them. Well, on top of that, we have lobotomies as well. And now this is something that's disappeared in the last 50 years. And what they did in those cases were essentially they would cause injury to the frontal lobe by putting a needle up into the brain, and that would also actually make some patients look better. Now, you have to kind of ask yourself, well, what is better and how do they measure that subjectively? Well, a lot of the times it was just the psychiatrist looking at the patients and finding that they complained less and they were more manageable. They're not looking at outcomes like, well, you know, how are their relationships? Are they working better? Do they have a higher quality of life? In many of these cases, these patients did not. And so most doctors today, they will acknowledge that things like insulin coma therapy and lobotomies are kind of barbaric and harmful, but that's not the case with ECT because in fact, many of them still describe it as one of the most effective treatments for depression. Now, again, you have to remember that doctors are measuring depression as reduction in the amount of complaints people are having, not actual tangible improvements in their life. And on top of this, many researchers have found that the effects of ECT don't actually carry on that long and many people will relapse within six months of having that treatment. And now you might be thinking, well, that's not great, but is this at least something that is safe? And if you ask that question, most psychiatric authorities will actually tell you that it is. They'll tell you that there is some concern about cognitive impairment but that it is not that common and it is generally short-lived. For instance, the ECT page on the Royal College of Psychiatry website informs patients that in most people, memory difficulties clear within two months from the last treatment and do not cause problem or distress. And on top of that, the website says it's very difficult to separate out the effects ECT has on memory from the effects on the illness that it's treating. Essentially saying that if you are having cognitive impairment from ECT, it's probably due to depression and you should not be blaming the procedure. And I have to just pause here and say that this is so common when it comes to any psychiatric intervention. If you get worse on a drug, they will say, well, you're probably worse because of your underlying condition. Gosh, we've even seen this when people have become suicidal. It is a classic technique to distract away from the fact that these procedures can actually be dangerous. And on top of that, they usually try and intimidate patients or different doctors who are complaining about this saying, if you talk about these risks, you are being unscientific. And not only that, you are scaring people away from life-saving medications. And because of this, very rarely do you actually hear about these problems. Now, this is obviously bullshit for many of the patients and the families of those who have actually gone through ECT. And this group has known that for decades, really since the 1940s when this was started, that this procedure can cause substantial and profound lasting cognitive and memory problems. And that's why 2025 has been one of the worst years for ECT doctors who have been trying to deny this because we've actually had some very good studies come out that have shed some light on just how serious this is. And so let's jump into some of them. We're gonna start with Matheson's study, which was published in the British Journal of Psychiatry. And they did a meta-analysis looking at cognitive impairment. And the thing that was very different about this, which is really important for people to know, is that they actually designed it correctly. Up until now, when researchers have been looking into cognitive impairment in ECT studies, they've essentially been looking at terrible data. Uh, the data from these clinical trials, they never used proper control groups they didn't use validated scales for measuring memory. You know, they used different scales that really didn't get that construct. So it wasn't very accurate either. They didn't follow patients over a long enough period of time. 
they would assess them after a couple of weeks, but they wouldn't look at what happened, you know, three months, six months, 12 months later. And because of that, all of the previous studies had been very, very poor. So poor, in fact, that I actually think it was very irresponsible for psychiatrists to have referenced these poorly designed studies, which essentially concluded that the memory impairment was not that big of a deal. And so coming back to the Matheson study now, so what they actually did is they used control groups, that's people who did not get ECT, uh, comparing to people who did get ECT, they used actual validated scales that were designed to assess for memory impairment, which is the primary things people have been worried about. And they also followed these patients over a longer period of time. And when they did this, this is what they found. Our systematic review suggests that ECT causes autobiographical memory loss in patients with depression. This is supported both narratively, but by our meta-analysis, which reveals a moderate effect on autobiographical memory compared to controls. The memory loss remained stable between the end of treatment and the long-term follow-up, was, which was between six to 12 months later, indicating that lost memories are not regained. And just to spell it out for you, they are talking about findings that suggest permanent cognitive impairment for some of these patients that undergo ECT. Again, very different than what you're seeing on the Royal College of Psychiatry websites and what most psychiatrists are telling their patients now. Now, the next thing you might be wondering is really how many patients have memory impairment following ECT? Well, we've had a couple studies look at this recently. Uh, Lee and his team, found that 61% of patients had memory impairment afterwards, and Chen found that 68% of patients had memory impairment afterwards. And so that's quite a sizable chunk. But what I wanna bring up now is that just two days ago, we had a survey conducted by Reed and his colleagues, uh, which was published in Ethical Human Psychology and Psychiatry. And this was essentially the largest survey to date of patients who had had ECT. And they wanted to look at how long this cognitive impairment lasted for. And so they looked at 1,141 patients and their family members to characterize this. And here's what they found. So you're looking at table eight here. So they're looking at retrograde amnesia. This is essentially um, forgetting things that had happened in the past. And so when they asked the, the people who filled out the survey, what effect did ECT have on your ability to remember events in your life that happened before ECT? 56% of them said it was much worse. And the families and friends, 45% of them said it was much worse. This is by far the biggest chunk of our answers from this survey. 25% said somewhat worse. Uh, again, 28% of the friends and family said somewhat worse. 18% said about the same. And 19% of the friends and family said about the same. And so this is kind of checking with what Lee and Chen had found that this was around 60 to 70% of people were having these problems and assuming it was rising to the level where it was much worse, they would have said that they were having this issue. But the thing that is really important about John Reed's study is actually table nine. And this was the question, how long did that memory impairment last for? And look at this, 81% of participants said it lasted for more than three years. 70% of friends and family said it lasted for more than three years. So these are two different sources of people. This is by far the lion's share of responses to this survey. And when you have something that's going on for three years or more, you start to worry that this is permanent, that these repeated seizures to the brain have actually caused permanent cognitive damage. And if you look at this table, this is the majority of them. Uh, the second highest category is one to three years at 7.6%. And so what this is saying is that the majority of patients who are getting ECT, you know, when it is making them worse, they are finding that it is lasting for several years. Now let's talk about the types of memory impairment that are occurring. So if we go down here to table 10, we have uh, people who report losing less, losing up to five years before 18. And so some people would say, I can't remember my last year of school in Germany. My entire year of high school is gone. But I wanna go down here and talk about some of these other things that are really important. So down here, adulthood holidays and significant trips. And so again, recipients 599. And so about 105. So this is about, you know, a little less than 10%. They said that they couldn't remember things like family trips, sometimes not even with photos. My first and only trip to Paris, three entire holidays. 
Down here, let's have a look at this. Important details of relationships with my partner or spouse. Recipients, 50. Again, a little less than 10%. And they said things like they couldn't remember getting married, meeting my partner, and I can't remember a single day I spent with my boyfriend of six years unless it happened a couple of days ago. Let's go down to parenthood and have a look at some of the things that people forgot here. Child's key experiences. Again, 48 out of 600 uh, reported this roughly less than 10%. They report they cannot remember children's birthdays and many other aspects of their lives. My child's graduation from high school. My daughter asks about events in her childhood and I have no memory of it. All right, let's go down here. Professional abilities, 26%. So this is um, about a little less than 5% of people here. They said that they were having problems remembering their professional career or education. And here are some of the examples. I can't remember all of my nursing career. He didn't remember his professional education and training well enough to remain employed in his field. This is not just memory impairment. We are talking about cognitive damage that is so substantial people aren't able to do their professional work that they've spent essentially years, sometimes even decades studying. I mean, this is devastating. And so I want to put this into context because I don't know if any of you have ever looked at those surveys where people say, you know, what, what do people regret or what do people think about on their deathbed? And usually they're talking about, I wish I had spent more time with my children. I wish I had gone on more trips. I wish I had done more things with my spouse. They're usually talking about these very important, intimate, personal relationships. And for many patients getting ECT, this is wiping that out. And that is clearly devastating. Now, you might be thinking with side effects like this and with the fact that the effectiveness of these interventions really isn't known that well and it doesn't really last that long, why would anyone be doing this? And that's where I have to talk about a really dark area in psychiatry. And that is how ECT is used these days. So. ECT is like the apex predator of psychiatric treatments. It is what is used after everything else has failed. If someone is on five or six different medications for depression, um, maybe they've done some ketamine as well and that didn't work, ECT. If someone is severely anxious um, and nothing else is working, ECT. It is where people go when they do not know why a patient isn't getting better with other things. And this makes sense. You might want to throw a Hail Mary essentially if nothing else is working. Why not just shock the brain and see if that sort of scrambling uh, helps the patient in some way? I would really advise ag against that because here's what I actually see happening in psychiatry. I see a lot of people who are on multiple different medications and those drugs are actually making people worse. I've seen time and time again that with long-term antidepressant treatment, many patients end up reporting cognitive dysfunction. They end up feeling really blunted, really numb and sometimes very anxious. I see lots of patients on benzodiazepines reporting a condition called uh, benzodiazepine-induced neurological dysfunction, where they become agoraphobic, they become severely anxious, they develop obsessive thoughts, and sometimes they even develop a kind of anxious restlessness where they cannot stop moving. And this can happen with all psychiatric medications. The human brain is not designed to be in a drug state for years and decades. And when you put it in a drug state for years and decades, some people gradually get worse. When I say this, this is usually a huge surprise to people because they say, well, the FDA said it was safe and effective. My doctor put me on these medications, so it must be safe and effective. Having worked at the FDA and in the pharmaceutical industry, I can tell you that none of these drugs have been studied for over a period of a year. Let that sink in for a second. They've never been looked at for a period of over a year in controlled trials, so we don't even know if they're effective or safe over that period of time. And obviously that's really important because these drugs clearly seem to wear off over time. And so essentially people on these medications long-term, uh, well, they're guinea pigs and we don't really know what's happening to them. And so what I think is going on with many patients is they get on a drug, the drug makes them worse. They get put on another drug to fix that side effect. That doesn't work because they're still on the original drug, which is harming them and they end up on a cascade of different medications. Eventually, they're essentially on a soup of drugs. You have no idea what's happening. You have no idea whether something is your depression or you're essentially getting harmed because you're on this cocktail of drugs and you get worse. And here's what happens to a lot of patients. They go and they see their doctor and they say, well, you have treatment-resistant depression 
And you know, these drugs, they clearly don't work because your depression, your brain is so broken, it needs the big guns. Let's go give you ECT. Now, I wanna ask you this question. What effect do you think it's gonna have on you if you're already having side effects from a drug, your brain is already getting kind of injured because not only are you on one drug, you're on multiple drugs long-term, which are hurting the brain. What effect do you think getting multiple seizures, sometimes up to 20 of them within a month is gonna have? Well, it's going to make you worse. You're gonna be more likely to have memory impairment. You're gonna be more likely to become disabled from that intervention. And that's unfortunately what I see. Many of these patients, they will go in thinking that they're getting their depression treated, but really they just have a whole bunch of medication side effects because they're on a soup of drugs. And then they develop cognitive impairment on top of that. When it doesn't work, the doctors say, well, this is clearly a sign that you have severe treatment resistant depression and you know, you've done everything that you could and now you just need to get on disability. These patients, they end up being disabled. They end up being looked after by their friends and families, usually at a tremendous cost and it is just a, a, an absolute loss of human capital and, and misery that could have been avoided if someone would have just looked at the patient, identified the side effects that they were having, and removed the drugs gradually over time, rather than just stacking on more psychiatric interventions and making them worse. And so to wrap on this monologue, here's what I'm going to say. If you are someone uh, who's considering ECT, here's when you want to run. So if you go and talk to the doctor and the doctor spends like, let's say, 45 minutes with you evaluating you for ECT, that's not enough time. The only time that you want to consider something like ECT is if someone has ruled out um, any drug related causes for it, you know, adverse reactions to the medications, maybe even medical problems. You can't do that in 45 minutes. Usually that takes several hours, especially if you've been on these medications for years and you're on five or six different drugs. You need someone to be considering that and going through those motions. Otherwise, you're just getting essentially transactional conveyor belt type care where the person comes in, they say, okay, we got a referral from your doctor for ECT. Yep, I do ECT, rubber stamp, let's kind of put you through the system. And you might say that this is really, really dark and don't these doctors care about me? And this kind of cuts to the heart of one of the sort of scary cynical things that I see with ECT doctors in the US and that is that many of them are actually doing it because they don't like normal outpatient care where you actually are way more involved with the patient. You have to talk to them. You have to kind of deal with their problems and chat with them. Many doctors who end up doing ECT, they don't like that. They are envious of like surgeons who have this procedural specialty where a patient just kind of turns up, they get sedated with the medication, they do their procedure, and then they hand them back to the outpatient doctor. It's very clean, it's not emotionally involved, there's high reimbursement from the insurance companies and they feel like they're doing this, you know, this really cutting edge procedural treatment. And so from my experience, they can be really transactional and not super invested in you and your care. And so that's something you wanna be really aware of. Okay, so that's it for me today. If you wanna to learn more about ECT, you're not gonna to wanna to miss this interview that I did recently.